Nightcast. Stephen Lloyd Gilbreth brings you the current news from the world today and how it relates to Bible prophecy. Understanding the end time events leading to the peaceful world tomorrow. Ladies and gentlemen, Stephen Lloyd Gilbreth. Well, greetings, friends, and welcome to this December 23rd, 2013 edition of Nightcast. Tonight in the news, we've got weather to begin with, weather report to begin with. But friends, I have to tell you first, before we get to this, whether you're into the Christmas season or not, holiday greetings abound, and many of the few who don't celebrate Xmas have had to learn how to deal with a, a Merry Christmas greeting over the years. This weather report will begin with such a greeting. But the report that follows the greeting contains some news that is good to be aware of, especially if you live in or are traveling to the U.S. or Eastern Canada. Snow and ice have affected parts of the U.S. and across much of Eastern Canada, cutting power to hundreds of thousands of homes. That's right, hundreds of thousands of homes without power. The infamous but very popular Rob Ford, mayor of Toronto, is calling it one of the worst storms in their city's history. Laura Westbrook has this video report. A white Christmas may be what many dream of at this time of year, but the first day of winter packs a powerful punch, bringing a bizarre mix of tornadoes, heavy rain, ice and snow. The storm system swept through more than 30 states in the U.S. and even into eastern Canada. Trees fell in houses, across roads and power lines, knocking out power to hundreds of thousands of homes in Michigan, New York and New England. Residents were told it could take days to get the lights back on. It's one of the busiest travel times of the year, and ice-covered roads wreaked havoc for drivers at a time when millions are expected to travel. Planes also refused to fly. This just one of more than 500 cancelled flights at major hubs including Chicago, Dallas and Houston, leaving thousands of passengers stranded. In Indiana and Ohio, heavy rain caused rivers to swell, forcing people from their homes. Firefighters using rafts to help evacuate people from their homes. Further south, tornadoes touched down in Arkansas and Louisiana, ripping the roof of this bookstore. We heard something falling, and then we saw the letters falling, and then we saw the uh, sides of the wall falling, and then I saw the transform over there blew up and flashed everywhere, the glass started shattering. Meanwhile, residents in Toronto woke up to a city covered in ice. Its mayor said it was one of the worst storms to ever strike the city. Hundreds of thousands of residents have been told to prepare for days without electricity. Laura Westbrook, BBC News. And friends, uh, it's not only the US, the UK is having their share of some problems with weather too with a heavy sea conditions in South Hampton. Gale force winds and heavy rain has caused widespread disruption across the UK. Robert Hall reports from a South Hampton control port. I'm in VTS, that's Southampton's port. And friends, I'm, I apologize. My fingers, I knocked the control board off the, off, off the desk panel here and uh, knocked that video out. Let me see if I can get that back. Here we go. I'm in uh, VTS, that's Southampton's port control. They look after something like 100 square miles of busy waterway. Not so busy today, though. Let's look at some pictures that we filmed just before it got dark. Uh, really quite heavy seas just off the dock head. Wind gusting to 70 miles an hour. Driving rain, not at all good rain, not at all good. Uh, flights at Southampton Airport have been disrupted. Ferry services to and from the Isle of Wight. When you look at the radar pictures here in the control room, you can see the problems that ships have in strong winds. They have to navigate down this channel, and as a result of that, we've got ships waiting at anchor here and here, unable to come into port. The other issue is getting pilots on and off ships. I was talking to a pilot earlier who took 
one of the two cruise liners that have left out in the last hour or so, not good travelling for them. He said he was taking his passport in case he couldn't get off the ship. And we also had a report from one of the pilot launches. They said that the waves uh, down here, just uh, as you get into the English Channel, were up to 30 feet high amongst the conditions, uh, conditions that they hadn't seen as bad as that for something like 16 years. Okay, so some unusual weather in both the U.S. and the U.K. Friends, while we're on the U.K., I've got a story from last night we ran out of time to show, didn't have time to show because I showed that 20-minute special. And if you didn't see that 20-minute special last night, you may want to be sure and go back to our archive and see not only that, but the 10 minutes of the program that... Uh, uh, contain some stories you really don't want to miss from last night. I didn't put the archive on YouTube, and that means it's not in Facebook, uh, where I often put it. Usually I've been putting it there every night. Because in the special we had video from the Syrian television, for which I don't have a license to show, but which I have under the United States law. I have permission to show under the um, fair use provisions of the copyright law, but because uh, YouTube has some content ID agreements that if you, if you trip it, you got to go through all kind of paperwork hassle to get you the strike cleared from your record. I've had several of those and I've won every one of them so far and we're okay there, but it's a hassle to go through. I didn't want to take a chance of tripping that, so because of that special that includes some incredible video from Syrian television that we were able to get our hands on. Now, it's in the Arabic, Arabian language, a man speaking in the Arabian language, but we've got English subtitles across the bottom explaining very clearly in English what the man is saying. He is, the man speaking is, the, is a former Iranian presidential advisor and Holy smoke, I usually wouldn't use that phrase, but, but it's so extreme what he's saying, how Iran tricked the United States and the United States taking a blind eye to it all. But it's very similar to, as I said in one of our videos from November, very similar to Arthur Neville Chamberlain going over to visit with Hitler back before World War II and coming back to England and telling everybody, oh, we don't have to worry here in England. We 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 got a deal with Hitler. We're hunky dory, and we got peace with Hitler. <laughs> and the next thing you know, boom, boom, drop bombs dropping all over London. And as they have to turn out their lights at night and hope that the air pallets can't know where to drop them, where people are, because their lights are out and they can't see a, an easy target. Anyway. Last night's got some program has some video in it that uh, be good if you want to stay on top of news to go back to the archive take a look at. But this is one I didn't have time to play because of that 20 minute special where Bulgaria warns Prime Minister Cameron of the UK over migrant plans. Here it is. Ten days and counting until we all need a new calendar and until the lifting of restrictions which are now causing a deepening row over immigration. From January the 1st, people here in Bulgaria and Romania can pack their bags, move to the UK and look for work. The government has changed the rules to prevent migrants from claiming out-of-work benefits for their first three months here. But this change, and some of the language used in discussing immigration, has irritated the president of Bulgaria. In an interview with The Observer, he says there's a danger of isolating Britain and damaging Britain's reputation. Immigration, he claims, is good for the UK. You guys are making a profit out of this. Keep it like that. Liberal Democrats say a cap on European Union migrants, referred to in a leaked Home Office document, would be illegal. And Vince Cable, for one, is not afraid of sounding off about the Conservatives. We periodically get these immigration panics in the UK. I, I remember going back to Enoch Powell and Rivers of Blood and, and all that, and if you go back a century, there was panics over Jewish immigrants coming from Eastern Europe. The responsibility of politicians in this situation, uh, when people are getting anxious, is to try to reassure them and give them facts and not panic. 
No word from the Prime Minister today, but he was in Brussels on Friday and said further rule changes would be needed if other countries join the European Union in future. As we contemplate countries like Serbia or Albania one day joining the EU, we must find a way to slow down full access to each other's labour markets until we can be sure this will not cause vast migrations. The bigger picture here is the rise of the UK Independence Party and the jostling for position that's going on ahead of the European elections in six months' time. There's also the Conservatives' desire to renegotiate our relationship with the European Union and then put our membership to a referendum in 2017. Chris Mason, BBC News, at Westminster. And friends, the Red Horse active tonight. Clashes broke out between troops loyal to... President Salva Clear, Kier, Kerr in South Sudan and others backing his former deputy a week ago. And James Copnell has a report tonight showing how um, what's going on here currently is uh, a report from a UN official in South Sudan telling how an atmosphere of fear and desperation ex exists as violence escalates. This is a time of desperation. Once more, South Sudanese are fleeing conflict and relying on food handouts to survive. And it's clear the fighting is not yet over. President Salva Kiir has promised his troops will retake the towns, now in the hands of his former deputy, Riek Mashar. The first town to fall was Bor, just to the north of Juba. By Saturday, Bentiu, in oil producing Unity State, was in rebel hands too. The troops are motivated, but so far the government's big offensive hasn't materialized. And as part of the chaos now enveloping South Sudan, groups of armed civilians are rampaging through the countryside. The UN says it will protect the people who have reached its camps. It's been difficult, but uh, we've been reinforcing the base, and the main thing to do in the next uh, 12, 24 hours is to make sure that everybody who is under the protection of the United Nations gets the best protection and the best possible safety and assistance that we can muster. Uh, we have been literally digging uh, and reinforcing the position for the last 36 hours. We will not allow a repeat of what has already struck us in Okobo. Some of the victims of Okobo, these Indian peacekeepers were killed last week and so were ethnic Dinka fleeing from armed Nua men too. The Nua were seeking revenge after their kinsmen were killed in Juba. An alleged coup attempt led to a growing war and now, increasingly, ethnic revenge attacks carried out by civilians. James Copnell, BBC News. And friends, similar news out of Egypt tonight where Coptic Christians are uh, being subjected to um, all kinds of violence and killing and the destruction of their churches. You'll see in tonight's report, similar to last night, a report how a mother's kids were killed and blown up by a suicide bomber as she was out shopping with her kids. And I'm going to show that video to you again tonight. Her family told her the kids were in the hospital. They didn't tell her the kids had been killed by this bomb because they could see she was so hurt by it all. And then when they told her, it's uh, it's uh, it'll, it, it, it could make you weep. And Jesus Christ wept over the things he saw happening around him. And uh, I'll have that video with that mother last night. There's another mother here who's going to talk about her child being killed in the violence in Egypt. Playtime for Philopatir, known as Fufu just three years old and already a victim of sectarian hatred. He was shot twice in the stomach when gunmen attacked Coptic Christians at a wedding in Cairo in October. Mariam, his seven-year-old sister, was one of the four people killed. She collapsed at the feet of their mother. When the shooting started, I didn't think it was live ammunition. I thought it was fireworks. I fell on my children and kept telling them, don't worry, don't be afraid. Mariam wasn't moving. 
I had no idea she was dead. Her husband, Ashraf, shows me the last picture ever taken of Mariam in her new outfit for the wedding. He says attacks on Christians go unpunished. And four hours drive away in Upper Egypt, more evidence of religious intolerance at a church in Minya City that was set alight. Fire raged here for about nine hours and only a shell was left standing. The church had been renovated just six months before and the devastation here was echoed elsewhere. Church officials say over a hundred religious buildings were damaged or destroyed in a single week in August. They say the attacks were systematic and premeditated. The local priest blames the Muslim Brotherhood and other Islamists for the attack on his church, which took place under the noses of police. The church is no more than 12 footsteps away from the Minya police headquarters. When people ask the police who were protecting their own headquarters to come and help us, they refused. They said they did not have orders to interfere in this problem. Church burnings are not the only torment. Hani Sethom, a pharmacist, was kidnapped in September. His wife had to raise $43,000 to get him back. He had been held for two days, brutally beaten and mistreated, and thrown in a pit. One of the kidnappers said, this is the death pit, where you will now be buried. As soon as I was pushed in, I could smell the dead bodies inside. The stench was unbearable. The guy put his gun in my mouth. I felt that these were my final moments. Back at the destroyed church, the congregation now pray under canvas in the courtyard. Christians here are hoping for better days for Egypt and for their community. They say the extremists are a minority and the faithful will be relying on God to keep them safe. Orligiran, BBC News, Minya. Hey friends, uh, here's another mother who lost her children. I played this last night, but I'm playing it again tonight for two reasons. One is, because of the 20-minute special last night, I didn't have time to show all of this video, and I promised you I'd play it again sometime this week. And I've got time to fit it in tonight, so I'm playing it again. Also, because it relates to the story that we just showed. Uh, and because I really believe it'll be good for all of us to either see this story again or see it for the first time because I believe this one can really touch your heart as you see this Iraqi mother grieving over the loss of her children who were killed in this horrible, violent way. Muna Adnan's life came to a halt a month ago. She was shopping with her children when suddenly, nearby, a suicide bomber detonated his explosives. She was so badly hurt, her family kept the truth from her. <laughs> It's been a month and I didn't know what had happened to them. But the truth was they were dead. I've just been told. It was a lie. They weren't in hospital. But my life is not beautiful anymore without them. I wish I would have died with them. The last thing she remembers was a hug from Omar, aged eight. His five-year-old sister, Hadja, died in their father's arms. People here are caught in the middle of a sectarian conflict. It's turning Iraqi against Iraqi, Sunni against Shia. More than 6,000 civilians have been killed this year. But Iraq's Prime Minister told us it's trouble outside the country that's to blame for the rising violence. We have high confidence that we will be able to contain this wave of terrorism 
which is not only dangerous to Iraq, but the whole region and maybe the world. But the solution should be to contain the terrorist crisis in Syria, which is nourishing terrorism in the region. In Baghdad, traffic is regularly brought to a standstill by increased security checks, but the security services don't have a grip on the insurgency. The minority Sunni population is blamed for the attacks. We met one man who was arrested in a government raid. Like many others, he says he was tortured. Fearful of reprisals, he asked for his identity to be concealed. My hands were cuffed behind my back. I was blindfolded and hung upside down from the ceiling. They wanted me to confess to something, but I didn't know what. Now I'm too scared to sleep in my own bed. I feel like a stranger living in Iraq. It's Shia neighborhoods that are bearing the brunt of the attacks. The Sunni extremists linked to Al-Qaeda try to tear this country apart along sectarian lines. This is a nation divided. One senior official told me that there are large swathes of the country where it simply isn't safe for the security services. Iraq's Shia-dominated government may be in power, but it isn't in control. Syria's sectarian conflict is a major concern for Iraqis. But many here believe that the solution to ending Al-Qaeda's resurgence in Iraq lies closer to home. The violence that has again engulfed the country will only be extinguished when Sunni and Shia Iraqis unite to end the terror. Quentin Somerville, BBC News, Baghdad. Friends, in this next report, the president, and that's the mother, again, a picture of the mother who, in that last video story, whose children were killed. Boy, that touches your heart, doesn't it? I hope it touches your heart from seeing this story. Well, the Cuban, pre our next story, Cuban President Raul Castro is calling for improved relations with the United States following a public handshake with President Obama at the memorial ceremony for Nelson Mandela. Sarah Ransford reports from Havana. No reclamamos a Estados Unidos que cambie su sistema político y social. Raul Castro doesn't speak in public much, unlike his brother Fidel used to, so his rare appearances are watched closely. This one was at an equally rare meeting of Cuba's parliament. Raul touched on relations with the United States, telling deputies they'd held talks on several issues of late, suggesting that relations between the old ideological foes can be civilized. That is, he said, so long as neither country expects the other to change its politics. Si realmente deseamos avanzar en las relaciones bilaterales, if we really wish to advance our bilateral relations, we will have to learn to mutually respect our differences and to get used to living with them peacefully. That's the only way. Any other way, and we are willing to take another 55 years in the same situation. You don't have to worry. comments followed this, the Cuban leader's first ever handshake with Barack Obama, a few seconds contact at the memorial service for Nelson Mandela. Officially, both sides dismiss it as mere courtesy, but others see a signal that things can change. That's partly because Cuba itself is changing. Raul Castro has overseen a series of reforms here, giving Cubans more economic freedom, whilst trying to ensure the socialist system survives. The latest step this week scrapped the need for special government permission to buy a car. The reforms have been slow going though, and many Cubans are frustrated. But their president told them that's not going to change. Sin prisas, pero sin pausas. The reforms will proceed without haste, but without stopping, Raul Castro reiterated, and he warned that those pressing for faster change will cause the reforms to fail. He called Cuba's deputies to reconvene in spring and approve a new law on foreign investment. Limited until now, he says foreign funds will play an important role in Cuba's economic development. That's clearly needed. Despite the reforms, the government has admitted that the economy here grew more slowly than predicted last year, and that this year's prospects are even worse. Sarah Rainsford, BBC News, Havana. Friends, now, if you want to watch last night's 
archive video, the archive video of last night's program, as I suggested to you earlier that you might want to try to do, you can find that that one's not on YouTube, as I explained, because of the content from Syrian television that we don't have a license for. So I don't want to trip any content ID uh, uh, copyright potential or licensing problems there. Uh, but uh, we do have it in the video archive on our own web pages. And you can get to uh, the archive video either through www.night-cast.tv or through uh, www.cogtv.org and then look for the video archive tab. Now, if you are one who has one of the little smartphones and you like to watch our program on a smartphone, as some of you have told me you're doing, you can get to a signal that is uh, custom designed for a smartphone that has the bandwidth trimmed just right for a smartphone and the sizing just right for a smartphone and a whole, not a whole lot of excess bandwidth so, to it so that it operates the, the best way on your smartphone. You can get to that signal by, instead of putting in www, type in M-O-B-I, Mobi. That's part of the word mobile, mobile or mobile. Just M-O-B-I dot C-O-G-T-V dot org, and that'll give you the live uh, uh, smartphone size and type of signal. Now, I don't think you can get the archive video through that website. In fact, I'm pretty sure you can't. So you'll still have to go, if you want to watch an archive, you'll still have to go on www.cogtv.org or www.night-cast.tv. Okay, that's how to get to the archive video. And talk about smartphones, where you can see the live program on a special smartphone uh, web signal by typing in Mobi dot cogtv.org mobi dot cogtv.org that leads into our next story where Apple has signed an iPhone deal with China rumors that Apple would be bringing its iPhones to China mobile customers have been circulating for months with 760 million subscribers, the deal presents the Silicon Valley technology giant with a massive opportunity for growth at a time when its overall share of the smartphone market is shrinking. Hundreds of millions of users. Apple's chief exec, Tim Cook, has acknowledged China is extremely important to the company. But its newly released handsets, the premium 5S and more colorful 5C, have only been available on China's two smaller mobile networks. Both models support the faster 4G mobile data network, which is about to come on stream in China. That comes at a cost, though. Selling at upwards of $700, they've been way more expensive than other smartphones, most of which run the alternative operating system Android, owned by Google. Pricing on China Mobile has yet to be announced, but it could prove crucial to Apple's ability to gain a significant foothold in the market. And friends, that's it for this Monday night report. God willing and the creek don't rise, we'll be back again Tuesday night with another half hour program of the current day's news related to, related to the Bible and prophecy here on Nightcast, which again you can see live on a smartphone with a good smartphone signal, especially designed for receiving it on the smartphone, if you go to Mobi, M O B I dot C O G T V dot org. And the C O G T V stands for Church of God Television. If that helps you remember it, C O G T V dot org. Just put Mobi, M O B I in front of it dot C O G T V dot org if you want to watch it with the best signal for the live video stream on a smartphone. Until next time, friends, your host Stephen Lloyd saying so long. You have been watching Nightcast with Stephen Lloyd Gilbreth. Nightcast can be seen Sunday through Thursday nights here on COGTV.org. Tonight's program is also available anytime on demand in the COGTV.org video archive.